Hello and welcome again to the Bright Edge webinar series. Today's presentation is going to be How to Be a Shark Among Penguins. My name is Eric Newton. I'm the Senior Director of Marketing Demand Generation at Bright Edge in headquarters in San Mateo, California. Today it is our pleasure to host one of our agency partners, Barracuda Digital, as the presenter in today's presentation. And uh, now I'll introduce Anthony to it, who will take over from here. Great. Hi, guys. Um, thank you for the introduction, Eric, and of course for having us here. Uh, a quick word, just a quick word on uh, who we are. As Eric mentioned, uh, I'm Anthony Tute, Head of Digital at uh, Barracuda, and we're a cross-channel digital marketing agency with specialisms in SEO, content strategy, content production, PPC display, social, and more. Uh, and we're based in London near Waterloo. Uh, there's about 20 of us here, um, and clients that sort of cross over the different sort of industries and sectors. Uh, and that at the bottom is, uh, is yours truly. Uh, and of course, as Harry mentioned, we're, uh, we're a very proud uh, Bright Edge partner uh, and advocate. Um, we use the software as a means of uh, managing organic digital marketing campaigns uh, in the key areas of uh, research, tracking, and reporting. Um, so let's get, uh, let's get straight into it. Um, why are we talking about penguins? Uh, well, uh, this is why. Um, penguin is a, a celebrated part of uh, Google's website rank, ranking mechanism and has historically had a, a large impact on uh, search results when it's been rolled out. Um, the tool actually here that you can see in the slide uh, is, uh, is Penguin tool, which uh, Barracuda, Barracuda created. So as uh, webmasters, marketers, and SEOs uh, can see uh, their organic traf uh, Google traffic uh, overlaid with major Google algorithm updates. So it's, uh, it'll hopefully be a, a go-to tool for getting an idea of whether the next uh, Penguin update has affected your site or not. Uh, I'll, I'll give my uh, email address at, um, at the end uh, again. Uh, so if you'd, uh, if you'd like to give it a, give it a go. Um, so as mentioned, uh, we're talking about Google rather than uh, any other search engine here when we're talking about Penguin. Uh, but uh, before we throw ourselves into what Penguin is, we need to understand where it came from, or it would be a good idea to understand where it came from, uh, in order to fully appreciate uh, what it's about and what we can expect from the next Penguin update. So let's take a, a trip back in time. Uh, back to uh, 1998 and the birth of Google uh, and the PageRank algorithm. Uh, this is the actual PageRank formula, um, and those cheeky chaps at the bottom are the Google founders uh, and PageRank inventors. Sergey Brin on the left and uh, Larry Page on the right. Uh, there's also a link there uh, just uh, on the left um, uh, to some further sort of uh, just interesting reading about uh, about PageRank. Um, so and, and watch out for those throughout the deck. So if you fancy digging a bit deeper um, after we've finished, um, then you can. Um, so uh, until this point, until uh, this point in 1998, um, uh, search engines really used sort of purely on-page factors to organize search results. Uh, all the results were sort of human create, cur curated, so you know, you'd actually have people going out into the web and uh, collecting web pages and putting them into some sort of index. Um, so Google was uh, was really a, a game changer because uh, PageRank algorithm uh, used links as well as various other on-page SEO factors as a means of ranking web pages. Um, to better visualize that, here's a sort of a, it's a nodes and edges visualization of. Um, what could be part of uh, of the web, um, and just to, to give a little context, so PageRank originally told us that links on the web can be interpreted as votes that are cast by the source for the target. So that would be the spots on here are our websites, uh, and the the links are yeah, yeah the, the the colored lines are the links, um, and all votes are initially considered equal. Over the course of executing uh, the algorithm on a, a link graph, so we say link graph, that's just basically all the links out there that can be found, um, pages which receive more votes become more important and more important pages cast more important votes. Uh, the votes a, a page can cast are actually they're a function of that page's importance divided by the number of votes or links cast. So if we give, for instance, uh, an arbitrary value uh, to, of, um, to two given web pages, one of 200 and the other uh, of 100, and the page worth 200 has four links pointing externally, and the page worth 100 has two links, then all links in this example between you know, on either website will pass a value or 50, uh, ignoring any kind of uh, uh, value bleed. 
Um, so yeah, within the within the diagram here, we can see that the, the you know the bright stars are the uh, the ones that have attracted most links and therefore will pass more value, uh, whereas the uh, the darker spots um, are less powerful. So uh, yeah, by God, uh, you know this worked. Uh, by 2003, Google had achieved the majority search engine uh, market share, um, and uh, you know it kept growing. Um, but Google was uh, becoming a victim of its own success. As uh, AdWords grew, uh, its advertising platform uh, grew in popularity, um, webmasters also began to realize that they could gain huge volumes uh, of highly relevant traffic through Google's organic listings and thus avoid or dodge um, uh, paying for it. All they really needed to do was build lots of links, uh, or build links, so yeah, um, uh, loads of them. Uh, and there were plenty available for, for the right price. And these links were uh, very often of questionable quality and certainly didn't represent a vote of confidence as Google had, uh, had intended links to be. Um, as such, they were labeled as spam, um, as they were spamming Google's algorithm. Um, and this became a serious problem for Sergey and, uh, and Larry, and apologies for this slide, uh, but I enjoyed creating it. Might uh, be overstating the issue slightly, but, uh, but not much. Um, on the one hand, PageRank had been a phenomenal success. PageRank worked, and it worked brilliantly. And no other search engine can provide, could provide the quality of results that Google could. A key reason why many of the old guard are now dead and buried, or certainly go, or going that way. On the other hand, uh, the algorithm was easy to manipulate. Uh, webmasters were able to create entire networks of websites with the sole purpose of linking through to other sites as a means of increasing rankings and hence organic search traffic. And frankly, in line with the random surfer model, any link would do, uh, so sidebar, footer, so on. Um, and it was easy to, to make spammy, low quality websites rank well for, for, those high for those valuable terms. As more webmasters latched onto this concept, more and more low quality websites started to appear in Google's search engine results. And by the way, what I mean by uh, random surfer model is that the assumption, the assumption from Google was that all links on a page uh, were just as likely to be clicked on and therefore all, uh, and therefore all carried the same weight in terms of passing value on. So whether it was a link in the editorial, in the, you know, in the, in the nav bar, the side, uh, sidebar, the footer, they all passed the same uh, the same uh, same value, and of course uh, this was a, an incorrect assumption, as it turns out, because um, uh, not all uh, because uh, some links are more should be more more uh, more equal than others. Um, and uh, apologies for the, uh, the well, the slide here is an uh, animal animal farm reference. Um, so we move on. The, the the reasonable surfer model was then created in 2004. Uh, and it attempted to algorithmically determine which links were more important than others based on which links your average user was most likely to click on. So for example, links contained in the unique editorial content on a page would carry more weight than a sidebar or footer link. But spam still remained a huge and growing issue. So for, for example, spammers could now spin article content, which is you know, taking an article and using a computer to jumble the words up and make a new unique, in inverted commas, uh, article. Um, and that article contained links. And so presto, you know, high value editorial based links. Gibberish, but you know, Google couldn't tell the difference. Um, and despite you know, employing Mac cuts, um, and after you know, several more of these algorithm updates on top of the casual surfer principle, uh, by 2008 it was, it was clear to Google uh, that they would need to take more drastic and heavy handed uh, measures to stem the tide of spam uh, from drowning out the voice and presence of high quality content created by virtuous webmasters and organizations. Um, and Google's own CEO, Eric Schmidt, uh, in uh, 2008 was um, quoted as saying that the internet had become a cesspool where false information thrived and that brands are, in fact, how you sort out the cesspool. So that's an important one. So really recognizing the affinity people have with brands, Google deemed uh, them as being credible sources of information. Right, okay. So they search for, they have communication strategies, um, they publish timely content, with terms of voice, and they have reputations to maintain. Um, so, in terms of uh, in terms of rankings, Google felt that brands should be the uh, the cream that naturally rises to the top, 
while low budget sort of bedroom affiliate sites uh, or what have you sitting on a sea of cheap poor quality links should sink to the bottom. So Google hit the uh, the new decade uh, with with a bang, um, and in February uh, 2011 launched what would uh, come to be termed the the Panda algorithm. Originally dubbed the farmer algorithm as it seemed to target uh, content farms, uh, so it's uh, Danny Sullivan that uh, coined that term, but. Um, uh, it was later then uh, re-coined re, uh, Panda uh, after Navneet Panda, the engineer who came up with the technology breakthrough through that uh, facilitated the new algorithm. Now, the real advance in the technology here was uh, the machine learning aspect and its ability to spot quality signal patterns in amongst the data it was fed to teach it, um, so uh, which is based which was based on human quality assessments uh, of websites. So Google's army of quality raters uh, around the world, and um, it could then apply these non-explicitly programmed content quality factors to the wider web without having to explicitly program what they were. So, um, I, I, yeah, and then this was uh, this was then followed shortly um, by today's main protagonist, Google's Penguin, uh, in April 2012. Now, Penguin focused on the quality of a website backlinks. Immediate casualties here uh, of our uh, flippered friend were uh, link farms, websites that had used link farms, sites whose backlinks came from site-wide links placed on non-contextually, uh, or placed non-contextually, um, and then uh, yeah, and, and, and where we sort of we've seen links where there's sort of an overuse of transactional anchor text and, and, and so on. The point is that both algorithms are about quality and were major steps forward in Google's ability to produce high quality search results. Um, they come at it from slightly different angles, but when we talk about one, we almost always end up talking about the other as well. Uh, so they're two sides of the same coin. So we now, so we now know what uh, you know, what Panda and Penguin are. But uh, why are we so concerned with uh, with Penguin uh, in particular uh, at the moment? Um, the fact is that the, these algorithms um, stand alone from the main Google ranking algorithm, and periodically uh, Google improves them and re-releases them. Uh, this isn't done sort of on the fly, um, but you know, rather offline. Um, it's you know, it's done offline, developed, and then applied to the uh, to the live web. Web. Um, at that point, new websites will be caught, and um, websites that have cleaned up their act will be um, sort of, in inverted commas, released. Um, and this is why we hear of uh, things like you know, Panda 4.1 and Penguin 3.0, and so on. Uh, they're sort of they're, they're, they're re-released new iterations of the same algorithm. So uh, as it stands, uh, we're imminently due a, a Penguin update. Uh, so that will be labeled um, in all likelihood Penguin 4.0. Uh, it's actually been over a year since, uh, since we had the last one. Um, that means, uh, actually incredibly, there are, uh, there are websites which have been caught uh, for bad linking practices uh, that have had uh, absolutely no chance of returning to favor um, for that entire period. So you know, ser serious financial implications there for, um, uh, for some websites. Um, an additional point of interest with this particular re-release is we are given to understand that Google will be uh, integrating of the Penguin algorithm with the main algorithm, um, and there's been yeah, there's been a fair amount of hype around that, uh, but in actual fact, it probably just means more regular updates uh, that we won't be necessarily informed of, uh, rather than anything we need to be particularly uh, worried about. However, the same hype that always surrounds these major and publicised algorithm updates is around uh, what the effect will be um, the expectation of improvements in the uh, search results. Of course, there's the uh, the nervousness from webmasters who naturally worry they might be caught up in the uh, in the new release. So, what's to be done? Well, um, chances are, if you haven't engaged in any spurious link uh, acquisition tactics uh, and you haven't been hit by a previous version uh, of the algorithm, then you will probably be fine. Um, however, if you are caught in the Penguin update this time around, the good news is you probably won't have to wait a year uh, to climb out uh, of the issue, um, so long as uh, you affect a thorough cleanup of your backlink profile um, subsequent to being being caught out. Um, the above is you know, what we featured here is an example uh, of, of a website that was, uh, yes, uh, it's smashed, I think that is a, a good way of uh, calling it, um, by Penguin 1.0. 
uh, or the first uh, the first iteration of the algorithm uh, and hasn't really recovered. Um, so it's it's this sustained drop in organic traffic around the time of the update that will be a key indicator that Penguin has struck, or if you prefer the metaphor, slapped you with a wet kipper. So um, if you are caught out, um, then this is effectively what needs to be done, or this is what does need to be done. Um, the process is, is relatively simple to explain, but uh, actually fairly laborious to, to execute, and the more so, the larger the backlink profile. So step one, uh, you need to get hold of as much of your uh, link data as you can. Um, none of the sources out there are, are complete. Um, but you need to get as uh, complete a picture as possible. Um, and Google doesn't give you this information. The, the links that you see in Webmaster Tools are only a, a fraction of, uh, usually only a fraction of uh, what, what, what's, uh, what's out there. Um, so, and actually uh, using the tool that I've highlighted here is, uh, is Link Research Tools. Um, it, and, and they combine lots of different data sets uh, for, for, for that purpose. So step two um, is then to analyze the quality of your backlinks and create a list of domains that are poor quality, uh, which is uh, easier said than done. And again, using a, a tool like Link Research Tools is a, is a great idea. Um, and then step three, uh, create, you need to then create a text file or disavow file. Uh, it's done in a, you've submitted in a text format, um, which is a list of the identified bad domains. Uh, and I would do it at a domain level rather than a, an individual link level. Um, so those bad domains linking to yours. Um, and, and then you need to submit it uh, to Google's disavow tool, which you can see a screenshot of it there. Um, this, uh, yeah, and this then effectively discounts those uh, those links, links from those domains that you've listed from Google's quality calculations. Uh, so, yeah, if you've done it right, the next time Penguin is updated, you'll be released. Um, but it should be noted um, that you were previously ranking uh, using bad links, which you will therefore, you will no longer have because you've this amount of them and Google spotted you out for having them. So when you do recover, it's very likely um, not going to be at the same level you were at before. So don't expect that sort of immediate return to uh, uh, re re immediate return to uh, prosperity and where, where at the level it was previously. Uh, just a quick note: I, I'm not I'm not affiliated with uh, Link Research Tools in any way. Uh, we just very much like the tool and we we use it internally here at Barracuda. Um, I, to be honest, if you do. If you have a large website and you do uh, you do come a cropper with uh, with with Penguin, then um, it it can, it can be easier to um, to yeah find find a yeah find an agency, find a freelancer who is uh, adept and has got experience doing it. As I say, it's easy to explain and uh, more difficult to uh, to administer. Um, so moving on, the yeah the the burning question really, and uh, you probably already guessed the answer to or already know, um, are links still important in uh, in 2016? Um, the answer is yeah, you bet, and emphatic yes. And um, the upshot is that links are still a huge part of Google's ranking algorithm. Um, and, and this chart, this uh, chart is from Moz's um, uh, 2015 ranking factors report. Um, and shows uh, you, it shows the result of uh, asking leading industry opinion. Uh, so not this is an actual fact. It's just lead, uh, industry opinion on what is uh, important and what's not. Ten being the highest. And as we can see at the top um, is, uh, um, is is links uh, sort of featuring featuring highest. And guess what? Yeah, the study, the correlative data that were, was pulled um, backed it up completely. Uh, so just quoting the study, uh, despite rumors to the contrary, the data continues to show some of the highest correlations between Google rankings and the number of links to a given page. Uh, now, a quick, quick note on that. So um, uh, correlation doesn't uh, equal causation, so please don't ignore what we've uh, just gone through and go and buy thousands of spammy links. That would be a bad idea. Um, so uh, yeah, to, I suppose to the, to, to the business end, um, how should an aspirational digital marketer uh, build links in a way that you know, succeeds uh, while also future-proofing uh, the website from Penguin Pandas and any other uh, Google critters that it uh, chooses to to release. And uh, the answer, I believe, is with um, what we term hub and uh, and hero content, and also uh, with a very solid method for distribution. And um, um, we we use you know PR, manual outreach, uh, paid channels, and yeah yeah I did say that paid channels for SEO. Um, 
things like native advertising, promoted Facebook posts, promoted tweets. And um, we're also paying very close attention to uh, Pinterest that it's launching its uh, ad platform as well uh, for promo uh, promotion of content. Um, PR is now SEO's bedfellow uh, and should be used as the primary link driver uh, where larger, more uh, investment-heavy hero pieces of content are concerned. So, the idea, you know, so get your hygiene content sorted, so your product, service, and category pages. Um, and then develop your brand voice outside of your products and services, so things where you're talking about things that are not your products and services, uh, with what, what we've termed hub content. And finally, extend what you're saying with your hub content with PR-worthy hero content that will drive awareness, traffic, and, of course, not least, powerful links. So in other words, you, know, you need to use your website as a platform to talk about things that have relevance to your business, but also have resonance with a wider, engaged conversation online. You know, create things that are different to what is already out there and that add value uh, to that conversation and also the individual user. And then distribute what you've created via PR outreach and those paid channels I mentioned. Um, and just to say, um, this chart is part of a, a larger organic strategy uh, chart, and I've included that in the appendix uh, right at the end. So let's break it down. Um, we'll, we'll assume your hygiene content is all sorted, your category cut, yeah, and your uh, product content. Um, so then moving on from there, yeah, when we start to think about hub content, start small and develop your, uh, your brand voice, as in what your business says outside of talking about its products and services. That's what the, the products and services, that's what you want to say. Uh, your business wants to say. Um, so you, usually this kind of content takes uh, the form of you know, regular postings in a blog, uh, so what we've termed the, the hub content. But don't just throw content up on a blog. It needs to be both relevant uh, and on, you know, so on brand, like I said, what you want to say. But it also needs to be resonant. There has to be an existing, engaged online conversation going on around what it is that you're trying to talk about. And, and, and you know, th this takes, you know, this takes research. Uh, a great place to start uh, that research and something that we use uh, internally here um, uh, is, is something like uh, BuzzSumo. I've got the link uh, just there on the, on the page. Uh, and you can use it to see what content pieces have already been successful, you know, what's been liked and so on um, the most. Um, in, in the content niche that you're considering uh, contributing to. Um, so, but you know, it's matching that, it's getting that balance between relevance and resonance and then creating something that's different and adds value, which is then summarized here. So once we, uh, we know which conversation we want to take part in, we've done that research, and we have a content schedule in, pl in place, um, then we need to move on and think about, yeah, think about hero content pieces. Um, which, frankly, are probably the only uh, legitimate, the, you know, sort of the only last legitimate uh, way of creating quality links at scale. Um, but you know, this only happens if uh, the content pieces achieve sticky status, and, and that's a big if. Um, and you will then need to put um, significant resource into distribution uh, or distributing this type of content. Otherwise, it's just not worth that initial uh, investment. As I said, you know, think PR. Um, so we'll come back to the sticky, uh, what I mentioned there, the sticky content, we'll disambiguate that in a minute. But um, to start with, here are four basic rules of, uh, of hero content. Okay, number one, it's got to be on brand, as we've said. It needs to be you know, relevant to you. Uh, it has to resonate with an existing engaged audience online. Um, three, it needs to be different uh, to what's already out there, otherwise it's just noise. And four, it must add value to the conversation and for those taking part in it. And then we need to satisfy, as I said, you know, the sticky standard, the six R's. This is what we call it, and it's success T sticky standard. Uh, it's a little bit of a mouthful, but uh, makes the point. Um, and you know, and this is absolutely hardwired into how we think about you know, hero content. So it needs to be um, simple. Uh, so find the core of any idea. It needs to be unexpected. Grab people's attention by surprising them. Get that reaction of oh, you know, when somebody looks at your piece of content. It needs to be concrete. So disambiguated. Uh, make sure an idea can be grasped and. Remembered later, uh, credible. Um, give an idea of believability. Um, are you, the, you know, if you're presenting data, are you believable? Um, emotional. Help people see the importance of uh, the idea. So you know, get and you, you know, using those emotional hooks, um, get that reaction from people. Uh, empower people to use an idea, um, to use an idea through narratives, so story-driven ideas. People remember those uh, much better. Um, 
and uh, shareable um, can and will people share our content the first is easier to answer the will people share our content um, is uh, is more tricky um, and then timely is the content temporally relevant uh, to current events so uh, you, do, you don't need all of these uh, but in this case you know more is more uh, and I would say your content piece or your hero content absolutely needs to be uh, unexpected for that one uh, and uh, and it also needs to have emotional hook so I'd, I'd make sure that you, you know when you're when assessing a piece of content, if you don't, if it hasn't got those, then um, you know I think that's 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 the absolute sort of basics. Um, this has actually been taken from. So we we based this uh, this methodology and uh, and the way we, you know our creative process actually on on this book by uh, Dan and Chip Heath. Um, it's called uh, Made to Stick, and uh, as the title of the slide suggests, it is awesome. Uh, I definitely recommend the read uh, if you're involved with uh, content creation. Um, so, and there's a, yeah, there's a link there as well. Um, so a, yeah, a good example of hero content at work is actually is actually our penguin tool. So uh, let's look at why. A quick reminder: so it's got to be relevant on brand. Uh, it's got to be resonant, needs to be different, and it needs to add value. So looking at that. Uh, okay, so we as a business, you know, understanding Google's algorithm is part of what we do, and that's what it's about here. Uh, there's a lot of conversation online among SEOs and webmasters uh, about the algorithm, Google's algorithm. Uh, and then we're mixing, so in terms of how we're different, um, we are mixing two data sets. Uh, so the algorithm updates with um, yeah, people's organic traffic data. And then the way we're adding value here is we're helping SEOs and webmasters to investigate and solve critical issues. So that's the, you know we 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 satisfied the um, uh, we've satisfied those criteria and actually you know, the, the penguin tool for us still remains um, you know, our you know, our largest sort of driver of um, of, of high quality links uh, and and actually traffic uh, through 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 to our website so um, yeah that that that's it at work I suppose so. Um, yeah, there is, a, and there is another option in terms of link building as well. And this is probably one that people, you know, this is where we sort of we, we can go into the into a bit of a grey area. Uh, but you know, off-site placed content. Um, so this is the, the idea here is it's outreaching to bloggers and pitching um, ideas to them for content that's going to be exclusive to their website, exclusive to them, and there's a partnership. Um, this, if you find if you find that this is um, this is scalable. Um, and quick and easy and cheap, then you're, I would suggest that you're doing it very, very wrong. Um, so that's where we can drift into that kind of get gray area. In reality, you know, this method is it's like one by one link building. It's not scalable, and it does require, you know, there needs to be a value exchange there between, you know, what the website's actually trying to do um, and yourself, and it needs to, you know, it needs to be contextually relevant and those sorts of things. Um, but, and yeah, you know, but we'd suggest you know what we've talked about prior to this slide and this this technique here. We'd, we'd suggest blending all the techniques if you if you possibly can in terms of building sustainable links. Um, just a, a, yeah, a quick couple of points. Um, one, uh, don't get share worthy and link worthy mixed up when we're talking about content. Uh, you know, there's yeah, it's a very common misconception that content which is shared a lot is also linked to a lot. Um, and this isn't the case, and has been. It's, it's been evangelised sort of within the industry, uh, but then sort of more recently, you know, with studies that we've seen, it's it, it's just not not necessarily the case. Um, so, uh, so uh, different content pieces uh, sort of often require different uh, distribution techniques, and should be should be treated differently as well. The way when, the way you think about it. So, either target your content uh, or the, your particular content piece. Um, and we're talking more like the, the hub content rather than the hero content. Um, we kind of want that to be both, but certainly with uh, hub content pieces, blog posts, that kind of thing. You know, um, either target it at social sharing uh, for awareness, um, or target it for uh, your, your links for domain power growth. Um, of course, you know, if you hit, but if you if you hit the sweet spot and get both, great. But ordinarily, these two, you, you, it's better to sort of split them out. Um, so uh, yeah, moving on to yeah our summary. Um, so links are indeed uh, important. You do need to be building links. Um, you need to be building high quality links to stay clear um, of Penguin. Um, you you need to probably build less. You, you probably need less of these than than you think. Uh, given that Penguin has been released and has cut a lot of the crap out vis-a-vis um, -vis the the link graph and the links out there probably less links than you think, but they need to be 
um, they need to be uh, higher quality. So invest in, certainly invest in, in, in fewer higher quality links and, and target yourself on that first and foremost, uh, and then you know, thinking about hero content later. Um, and, yeah, and yeah, to reiterate, link building is no longer scalable. Um, it, it isn't that, you know, pay the money, spin the article, hit the button, and you get lots of links and, and, you, and your rankings shoot up. That just isn't the case. Um, and, and yeah, you will get hit by, uh, for, for doing that. Um, so expect it to be laborious. Um, and yeah, and as I said before, yeah, hero content is really the last bastion of um, scalable link building. Um, but it does tend to require more investment sort of earlier on. Um, and in line with that, if you are doing it, um, and you know, for, for when you're doing uh, you know, uh, blog type content, or hub content, embrace PR. Uh, you know, PR and SEO are now, yeah, as I said, bed, bedfellows, um, and uh, it is an, a, an absolutely quintessential um, uh, outreach technique uh, for building uh, powerful links. And yeah, and last note, really, you don't let your competitors get too far ahead in this sort of activity, um, because as, I, as I've been saying here, you know, there are no quick fixes, uh, and you, you, you know, we don't want to get left behind. So, uh, so that, that's that. Um, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Eric. Um, and yeah, if anyone is interested in using the, the Penguin tool, um, then my uh, email is there again. Thanks very much. All right, Anthony. Great presentation. Uh, thank you. And uh, a couple questions have come in while you were speaking. So this is going to be the Q&A section. One of the most popular questions I get when I do webinars is, uh, will we get a copy of the deck and did you record this? And the answer to both is yes. So I will send out links to the material so everybody can uh, can go over it again because there was a lot of good uh, good and repurposable content in it. So I've got a series of questions here, Anthony. Uh, first one is, you mentioned paid paid content promotion. What do you mean by that? Yeah, sure. So uh, I mean, there's a yeah, current piece. I can't, I can't name the client that we're we're working for, but there's a current piece of content that we're doing at the moment, a hero piece of content. Uh, and you know, the way in which we're going to be promoting that, yes, we're going to be using PR, so that's not a paid angle. But the other, the other things that we're going to be doing is using is using native advertising. So you know, that's going to be placing uh, placing those content ads within the sort of directly within the context of um, third-party websites, uh, you know, publisher websites, that sort of thing. Uh, but we're also going to be doing things like. Uh, using Facebook's um, uh, demographic targeting to get you know get in touch with the and put a put a promoted Facebook post in front of those guys. Um, using promoted Twitter uh, uh, tweets uh, in the same way. Uh, and as I mentioned as well, you know things like yeah, there are um, the other social platforms out there as well um, uh, that are, are creating paid platforms too. So as I say, Pinterest is just on the cusp of releasing a, uh, a paid platform. Um, which I think is going to be really interesting for, because you know, obviously it's very visual. Um, so if we're talking about visual content and things like that, then you know, uh, I, I think that could be effective for driving driving awareness. But really, yes, yeah, using those social channels, using um, using native advertising, and actually, uh, if we think about it, you know, it, it, there's there's no harm in in using uh, in using display advertising, PPC, that kind of thing for for your content. We traditionally think of Perhaps think of PPC as, uh, as, as only promoting, uh, you know, your, your category and uh, product pages and so on at the point of consideration in the, uh, uh, you know, in, in the conversion funnel. But, you know, what, what if we could uh, bid on terms that are, are fairly cheap, but they're not going to convert quickly, but they're there to drive awareness in the content that we're producing as well. So there's a whole, you know, and, and then once we've done that and we've promoted people and we've got eyes on the content piece, you know that's that's generating the awareness, and then from that we can then um, we can then you know we can then sort of drive the, the you know with that interest we can package that up and outreach it to people where we then get the links. Like I say, there isn't necessarily that direct link between um, between the, the the paid promotion and getting the links, but when we're when we're talking about content sort of bigger content pieces, we want the whole thing. We want awareness, branding, and all that stuff, and we want traffic to the website. And we also want to be able to PR it and get the links. Um, you know, it's that, that's it. Yeah. So Anthony got it. It's the paid, earned, and owned. So it's a syndication me mechanism for awareness, which can lead to backlinks, but it doesn't necessarily lead to because uh, then they would be paid links, right? Yeah. Exactly. No, I'm not. Uh, yeah, I'm certainly not advocating you know going out there and paying for links. I hope sure. that's that's come across as uh, as clear. But obviously, sure. there's. 
you know, where you, you, the, the point is you will be expending resource in some way in order to get in sure. order to get these links. And but the, the legitimate way to do it is with legitimate digital marketing, and that's where you you know that's where you're creating a, uh, a you know an asset that is sticky um, that people are going to want to uh, interact with, and therefore if they want to if people want to interact with it and there's a conversation that's going on around it, you're going to have a much easier job of selling that into, you know, um, the, you know, the bigger websites, the bigger sort of um, editorial websites uh, mm -hmm. who are going to want to feature it and get in on that conversation as well. And, and when they feature it, that's where the links come in. Got it. Next question. When you say use PR, do you mean get our PR stories on news websites which have a link to our website within the story, or do you mean upload the PR stories to our own website or both? Now, what I actually mean there is using your PR team to outreach your, you, you know, the content that you're doing for, you know, this kind of awareness, this, this awareness content, this SEO content. So that could be, yeah. So the work that they're currently doing from a PR point of view is going to be to drive awareness and so on and so forth. Um, so it's it, it, it's partly that. But what 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 I'm you know, what I'm specifically getting at is using the PR expertise to when you're creating a piece of content like this or when you, when you have something that you believe is PRable. Um, and and what I'm talking here is probably not things that are directly or that are related to your products and services, yes, you should be PRing what you're doing and things on that side. Uh, that's for different purposes. What I'm talking about here is you know, when you've created a piece of content that resonates um, with, with an audience out there that you think is sticky and that is going to get you some attention, use your PR expertise, use your PR experts to get it out there and get it placed and get the coverage for that piece of content. Um, so as uh, so yeah, so as you can get you get the coverage, you get the awareness, you drive the referral traffic, and you get those high-powered links. Got it. A couple more questions have come in. We've got about seven minutes left. Um, sure. Do, do brands have to worry about Penguin if they don't do Black Hat? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was kind of the point that I was trying to make earlier in the in the, in the deck as well. It's like if you if you're, you know, b being a brand does not exclude you from being hit by Penguin. Um, but if you've not engaged in any black hat techniques, uh, any website, if if you're a website and you haven't engaged in black hat techniques and you haven't gone out there and done it, uh, then then no, you 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 shouldn't in theory have anything to to worry about with uh, with Penguin. That's it's going after those. Those spammy links. Now, you know there are arguments. You know, probably not something to get into it at the moment. You know there are arguments in terms of sort of things like you know, negative SEO. We have to worry about that. But from what I can see, you know those. Unless you're working in a particularly spammy niche, you're probably not um, going to be at risk from that sort of thing. But you know that's when you know someone, as you know, a webmaster will, uh, in a cynical sort of way, will target rubbish links at a competitor's website. You know that that that's, that's the theory. But um, I don't think, you know, if, in, in most in most circles, in most industries, I don't, I don't think that's something that really needs to be worried about. Um, but yeah, being a brand doesn't exclude you from Penguin. Um, but if you're if you've been behaving yourself from a link point of view, then uh, uh, no, you should be fine. All right. How long does rank recovery take after disavowing, say, you, say negative SEO? Yeah, I mean that's uh, that's a tricky question to answer. The answer is kind of one of those. It's uh, how long is a piece of string? Um, I mean, one of the main things, when you have disavowed, I mean, if you have disavowed, if you had an issue, you've seen that sustained drop, you've done the disavow uh, process, remember that, you know, when in terms of um, rankings, you know, those rankings are driven by, uh, by links as well as many other factors, but, you know, we're talking about links here, so it's driven by links. And previously when you were ranking well, you were ranking well sat on, uh, in part at least, sat on a pile of bad links and they were helping you to rank. So now that they have gone and you've removed those or you know, so you've disavowed them, in terms of you know, you, that will get rid of the penalty but it will not necessarily return your rankings. What it will do is clean the slate for you so that you can start engaging in good, uh, you know, good practice uh, link building, generate more links. Uh, and when you generate those new links, that's what will drive your rankings. But if you don't remove the if you don't remove the uh, the, the penguin filter first, then you won't be able to escape. You know, you, you won't be able to take advantage of that new link building. But it, it, it's more like that process. Unfortunately, it isn't a kind of right. I've got rid of the bad stuff now. Give me my rankings back. It's like well, no. But you had those rankings before, based in part at least on bad links. Now that you've removed those, you've kind of removed. Your ability to rank, you know, it's that that was the what was enabling you to rank for that before. 
So, uh, so yeah, it's removal, get out of Penguin, um, and then start link building in, in, in a sort of a, in a vertical commas white hat way, or in the ways that we've been uh, that, that's been explained here today, and um, that's what's going to drive your rankings back up. Got it. You mentioned in one of your slides that if your link building process is easy and scalable, you're doing it wrong. What did you mean by that? <laughs> I mean because if it is easy and scalable and cheap, it means you're probably buying <laughs> you're probably buying crap crap links with spun content and so on, uh, uh, and doing it that way. The whole, the, my point there really was just to say if you're doing it in a proper way, if you're going out there and manually trying to find websites that you can partner with and you're spending time engaging with them on you know, phone, email to say, right, how can we benefit each other with creating content unique for your site? You know, that's a laborious process. Whereas if you were just say, if you've got, if there's a, you know, if there's a, um, you know, a, a hub of, if there's a, a network of, uh, you know, automatically generated websites out there and you're just paying to automatically place you know, uh, gibberish on those websites, you know, yes, that's easy, yes, that's cheap, but, you know, that, that's, you're doing it wrong. Um, so that, that's what I meant there. All right. Well, that's it for our questions. I want to thank everybody for joining us today for this uh, webinar, and we look forward to seeing cool. you on a future webinar. And thanks so much, Anthony, for an, a wonderful presentation. Take care. Bye -bye. No problem. Thanks for having us, Eric. Cheers.